Welcome back to Appalachian Intelligence. We're extremely grateful that you guys would join us again for another week, for another episode. With you tonight, per the usual, your hosts, Justin, Ryan, and Lance. Ryan, Lance, how you fellas doing this evening? Well, I'm doing flipping fantastic. How about you, Lance? I'm glad to be back. I hate that I missed last week. Such a good episode, and I couldn't be a part of it. Y'all did not want to hear me squeaking and talking like a prepubescent boy for two hours either. So I figured I'd see you don't ears. know if I wanted to hear that or not. <laughs> well, you missed a good one, Lance. You missed a really good one. And that was uh that was kind of your area of expertise. You know, this guy naming off all this sciencey stuff. Justin from Cryptids of the Corn, man, he was just he was firing. Like he named like 37 different animals and asked if we knew about it. I was like, nope, never heard of it. I don't know what you're talking about, sir. But no, it was a great episode, dude. It was, it was a lot of fun. Those guys were a lot of fun. Uh, you know, again, we appreciate them coming on here and educating us in a lot of the, the areas. And do that topic of living UFOs, of, of you know, organisms that – people are seeing you know making up a small percentage of the ufo sightings and how they imitate like ocean creatures and ocean life it's just it's super interesting super interesting so again justin and jay cryptids of the corn we appreciate those boys you guys go check out that podcast um show them all the hill folk love before we jump in and get started today uh we're going to share one of our most recent five-star reviews. Uh, this one comes from Hippopotapud. <laughs> I love that. I love it. And Hippopotapud says, down to earth and interesting. Just heard you guys on the confessionals. Can't wait to get sucked into your shows. Here's the five stars all the way from Australia. So... Hippopotapud from Australia. Consider really, yourself sucked. <laughs> we really, really, really appreciate it. That's the wrong podcast, Ryan. You're, you're on the wrong show. No, he wanted to get sucked into our show. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, we, we really, really, really do appreciate it. Um, it's really awesome to hear from people outside the U.S. Um, awesome to hear from an Aussie, I'd give you my best Australian accent right now, but I'm not going to torture you guys with that. So, yeah. I actually, I was like, man, I'm going to read this review in an Australian accent. And I was like, nah, I better we'll, not we'll do just, that. We'll just, uh, we'll just choose to show gratitude without being culturally offensive. <laughs> <laughs> now, would we ever be culturally offensive? In anything that we say or do. What you talking about, Willis? Boy, I think it's nothing better than a good old boy from the middle of Appalachian Mountains trying to imitate an Australian. That would be first class, yeah. top shelf, no dust type of stuff there. Yeah. It's not, not a big deal. I can do a great Steve Irwin. Great. Too soon. <laughs> too soon. It's not too soon. That was years and years ago, Lance. Still too soon for me. It is me too. I was a big fan of Steve Irwin. But speaking of that review and uh, coming over from the confessionals, just to hit on that for a minute, um, as most of you know, or all of you should know by this point, because we have pumped and pumped and pumped it since the episode dropped on social media and, and you know, all this and that. But you boys here did uh, – we – Tony was gracious enough to invite us in studio to talk about our mystery adventure with the petroglyphs on the rock and the, the swift silver mine and, you know, all of our information that we've received and all of the, the time spent putting into this and the adventure that we're setting out on and all that. So if you guys haven't listened to that episode, go check it out on the confessionals. Again, we want to thank Tony. He was a fantastic host. He, uh, he, you know, he's gracious enough to let us come in and he's, you know, he's pushed this show. Um, 
and now he's you know he's kind of part of our treasure hunting team too so yeah <laughs> i mean even if it's just for us to to take him to the rock and use a little bit of his blood to see if it'll open up a portal yeah sorry tony we might have to do it <laughs> sorry we have to do. no risk no biscuit again we'll do what we have to do for scientific purposes <laughs> we will do it but no we again you guys that it was a it was a whole lot of fun. It was a blast. I mean, I think we we got down there at like 10 o'clock that morning or 9 o'clock that morning, something like that. We stuck around for like five or six hours just talking and, and chopping it up with Tony and, and Cody. You know, we don't want to forget Cody. Cody was awesome to have down there working the sound and, and just giving like different pieces of information and in, in conversation. Uh, it was just – it was a good time. I mean, it's it's always fun to be able to sit down and and chop it up with people that operate in the same realm that that you do have the same kind of interests. But it was also cool to see, you know, somebody that you know started out driving truck, you know, had a full time job and literally has built a media or is building a media empire from the ground up. You know, he's he's done what we're all kind of striving to do. You know, is to be able to to do something like this full time, man. Just to to dive in, like you think the stuff we talk about is crazy now. You give us all day long to sit around and look up junk. We'll go off the wall. But speaking of going off the wall, speaking of giving us time to look into junk, we're going to dive right into it, you know, folk. You know, usually. And you guys that have stuck around with us for a while now, you know, we're not deep, deep divers into topics. That's that's not really what this show is about. You know, we like bringing on guests and hearing about their stories or their theories or their expertise. Or we like finding these topics and then just having conversation about it. But a lot of times, you know, we don't know a whole lot. You know, we haven't dived really, really deep into what the you know the topic that we're talking about but for this one ryan has dove really deep down a rabbit hole and this is pretty much just going to be the ryan show y'all so all of you ryan fans out there which is most of you i get the (laughs) i get the messages i get the emails and i see the one name that's always mentioned specifically Y'all are getting a heavy dose. Uh, you're getting a macro dose of Ryan in this. In true one. Ryan fashion. In true macro Ryan dose. fashion. True mm-hmm. Ryan fashion. That's right, folks. I wrote this episode over several hours of painstaking labor. Not really. I said he wasn't he, man he wasn't he wasn't in labor. No. Technically. It was just <laughs> he was working hard at it. That's what he means there. Yeah. Uh, I'm not trans. I can't get pregnant. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> well, there starts the cultural events of jokes. So, give me one second. He's also, also yeah, I'm also getting sick, guys. So you're going to have to bear with me. If I got a cough, I don't want to cough into the microphone, of course. This has been a rough month for the AI guys. It's yeah. been a rough month. We've had battling. Just a battle. Yeah. We've been struggling. We've been struggling. Flu, it, whatever, sinus infections, pneumonia, I'm pretty sure. It, it's been rough. It's been rough. So I appreciate you guys sticking it out with us. Yeah. And I'm going to do my best tonight. So you guys ready? Oh, yeah. I'm so ready. I've been unable to sleep. I'm so ready. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to kind of set the scene here. It's December 26, 2002. Temperatures are just above freezing in New Mexico. 80-year-old Walter Howe is leaving his home located just six miles from Walker Air Force Base where he was once the public information officer. So basically the PR guy. 
Uh, just two miles south of that base is the International UFO Muse Museum and Research Center, of which Walter uh, founded. Uh, he's one of three owners, in the, and that's still there today. Uh, he takes he takes a bus into town. He's on a, he's on a mission today. All right, he's on his way to the local notary, Beverly Morgan, to have as what he called it a written statement signed and sealed. Of course, later we'll learn it's so much more than that. Walter has been holding on to a secret for a long time, uh, more than 50 years, actually. Uh, but he did this out of a sense of duty and respect for his country and an old friend. You see, Walter was the public information officer, but the base wasn't known as Walker Air Force Base. It was called Roswell Army Airfield, and the year was 1947. Oh, <laughs> Roswell, so, baby. Anybody that knows anything, when you hear the word Roswell, you automatically think aliens, government cover-up. You know, they said it was this, then they said it was a weather balloon, and then there were congressional hearings and all this. Well, what they didn't count on was eventually these guys walking around with all these secrets, you know, they've had to bear the weight of these secrets for years, decades. And, you know, when it's getting close to time for them to die, you know, a lot of people feel like they need to get something off of them, whether it be an affair, government cover-up, you know, murder. A lot of deathbed confessions happen, which I want to give a shout-out to a podcast. Basically, all my information came from this podcast because they did. I went through a couple of websites, but there wasn't anything there that they didn't cover. So... Basically, deathbed confessions. There, this was they did a fantastic job researching this stuff. So, this is where I pulled the idea from. But you know, my way. All right, so let me get back over here. So we've established he's at Roswell. The year is nineteen forty-seven. So a little bit about Walter Hallett. He's born in nineteen twenty-two. Not much is known about his childhood. Uh, however, in 1939, when the country was on the brink of war, he joined the Air Force. He flew over 35 successful missions to Japan and was awarded numerous accommodations and medals. After the war, he was shipped back home and then his station at Roswell Army Airfield in 1947. So I think he showed up I want to say they said it was like April. And of course, we know it was July 7th and 8th that all this went down on Roswell. So he was got there like just before. All right. So from here, so we got a little bit of background on him. He's flew 35 missions to Japan, which is a feat. That was, that's freaking ridiculous. All right. He threw over 35 missions to Japan, all kinds of medals, everything like that. Um, we're going to learn a lot more about Walter as we move on here. But right now, we have to take a step out of New Mexico and travel about 1,600 miles northwest to the great state of Washington. All right, because just nine days before the Roswell event, there was something going on in Washington and Idaho and all these other states, and then starting in New Mexico. And uh, it's what leads us to the Roswell incident. So right now we're going to go to the state of Washington. And on June 24th, 1947, amateur pilot Kenneth Arnold is gearing up to fly his plane into the town of Yakima. He plans on making a detour to search for a marine transport plane that went down somewhere near Mount Rainier 
and there's a $5,000 bounty on it. Now, this is 1947, so you can imagine $5,000 is more than most yearly salaries, you know. So he's going that way anyway. He's like, I'm going to go look for this wreckage, you know, on my way over in the Mount Rainier area. Okay, give me just one second. Sorry about that. A second. You don't get a second, Ron. Had to cough. Had to had to get that up. Okay, so let me see where we're at here. So he plans on making the detour. Conditions are great for flying. Like the weather is perfect. There's not much of any kind of wind. It's clear. You can see for a good long ways. So since he's looking for this marine plane, you know, he's he's being hyper vigilant and paying attention to everything. And he's flying along and he sees a glint, like a reflection of light out of the corner of his eye. And he starts to panic because he's thinking, holy shit, I've been looking for this wreckage and I've almost flown into another plane. Well, he's checking and there's no other planes around except for one like 20 miles up on the high horizon. And I... Uh, I think you call it a D-29, uh, DC-4. Yeah, so it's flying like 20 miles off in the distance. So he's looking around. He can't find anything that's made this blend. Well, it, let's see. So he's looking around. He can't find anything except for that DC-4. He relaxes a few minute, for a few minutes, and he sees the flash again. This time... Notices that whatever it is he's seeing, there's more than one of them. And now he's actually getting focused in on these things. And they're about 20 miles away, but closing in. And he, you know, he's trying to reason with himself what it is he's seeing. At first he's like, is that a flock of geese or something? And then he realizes it's not a flock of geese. You know, they're not metallic. They're going to shine lights like that. And the way they move is unlike any aircraft he's ever seen before. And as they approach, he's noticing they're a lot darker in color than he originally thought. And one of them is crescent shaped. And the others are all like cookie cutter, perfect molds of each other, these discs. So... He's thinking, well, maybe this is some kind of top secret jet that the military's testing out and, you know, nobody knows about it. But then he thinks, well, if it's some kind of plane, then why aren't they leaving a trail behind? So anyway, they pass him and now they're flying in a manner with like, they're like links in a chain, like. Whatever move the first one does, they all do the same move. But they maneuver like up, down, left, right. It's, it's going, it's crazy. So he readjusts his course. And as he as he's passing them, comparing them to the size of the DC-4 plane and knowing the size of the DC-4 plane he's seen earlier, he estimates these things to have, they have to be 100 feet in length. So like I said, he's, he's changed his course to follow them and he opens one of his windows to make sure it's not like a trick of the glass and he's actually seeing what he's seeing. But it's not a trick of the glass, so he continues following them and then kind of marks his location for a certain amount of time. And based on the distance covered, guesstimates that they were traveling about 1,700 miles per hour. Holy crap. Yeah. So, and fun fact with Kenneth Arnold, he later on, he goes to do, let me see if I wrote this down. No. Uh, he goes on to do a bunch of interviews and things and he's doing one in Oregon and that's when the term flying saucer is actually created because hmm. he calls it like a saucer shape hmm. interesting interesting extremely interesting cool. 
Oh my god, I wasn't muted the whole time. Okay. Son of a <laughs> bitch. All right, let me get back to the story. Sorry, folks. I thought I muted myself. Okay, so uh, ten days later, on July fourth, I'm sorry, I gave you the wrong time that this happened before the Roswell incident. Anyway, ten days later, on July fourth, a United Airlines crew reported seeing nine dish-shaped objects over Idaho. In total. 853 separate sightings are reported and are nearly all described the same way. In that time frame, in that 10 day time frame? Yeah. 853. 853 separate reports. And were they all in that same area, like that Washington, Idaho, yeah, Washington, that Idaho Pacific Northwest area? And New Mexico, though. Huh. Okay, so which we're done in the Northwest. We're headed back to Mex New Mexico. Okay. We're going to talk about a, a sheep rancher named Mac Brazel. Actually, I want to say his name was something else, but they said his friends called him Mac. So he's dead. I'll, I'll just consider myself a friend and call him Mac. Mama calls so, him Max. I'm going to call him Max. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, okay, he's, so he's gone. So Max, is, he's a sheep rancher, all right. He down just outside of Roswell, just a couple of miles of Roswell. Uh, he didn't have a television, a phone, or a radio. No way of knowing about all these sightings going on or any of this stuff happening. So he goes into town for supplies, but not Roswell. He goes into another town. Um, uh, I wish I'd wrote that down now. Coronado or something like that. But anyway, he goes into that town, and that's when he starts hearing all this news. You know, he finds out about all the UFO sightings. He starts wondering if these sightings could have anything to do with the mysterious debris he found scattered across a square mile of his ranch. Now he's already collected this debris, but hasn't disposed of it yet. So he goes back to the ranch on Sunday, loads it into his truck. Monday morning, heads into Roswell and goes straight to the sheriff's office. So the sheriff pretty much tells him, you know, this isn't our jurisdiction. There was no crime committed. We don't, we don't even know what this is. And it, it maybe it was fake, but at that moment, the sheriff takes a phone call. And on the other end of the line is a local radio announcer named Frank Joyce, who's looking for any local stories. So the sheriff just hands the phone to Mac. Joyce tells Mac to report it to the officials at Roswell Army Airfield. Mac does, and they send out none other than Major Jesse Marcel to investigate the claim. So wait, 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 wait. Now Jesse Marcel, he's he's in some of the more famous, like all the Roswell photos. He is the man just, in the most famous Roswell photo. He's okay, the one bent okay. down holding the debris, looking back at General Roger Ramey. I thought I knew that name. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Sorry, go ahead. So Jesse Marcel. All right. Now Marcel goes out. Now we're gonna learn a lot more about him later. Uh, because in the second part of this I wrote, he I'm gonna go deeper in information about it. But I'm just gonna give you how he kind of is involved in this right now. So Marcel goes to the actual crash site and gathers as much of the material as he can fit into his baby blue convertible into the trunk and he then takes it home since it's so late no other officials remain on post he goes upstairs wakes his son up brings him downstairs and they actually look and his son as a little eight-year-old kid gets to handle this debris and look at all this and uh you know his son is going to play a role in this story later as well but uh 
Yeah, so he, his son actually got to do it. He takes it back out to the trunk. He stashes it back away. Next morning, uh, 07.30, Marcel brings the debris on the post. It's time for the staff meeting. So we're going to get into this staff meeting in more depth later as well. Now, in the meeting, they're told there's a second crash. That's much closer to base. So the so that guy, uh, the crash they're talking about was like forty miles out of Roswell or whatever. But there was another crash about five miles from base that wasn't well known about, and that is the one the base had interest in. And they actually wanted them to talk about the other crash so nobody would pay attention to that one. Hmm. Yes. So that's the infamous weather balloon was the crash that happened about five miles away from base. Well, yes. You know, I, and, that, and weather balloons, I've got in air quotes there, the yes. infamous weather balloon. Okay. Well, okay. Okay. Dude, I'm I'm digging it. I'm digging it. I'm so, digging it. We're in the staff meeting, right? They learned there's a second crash site much closer to post, and the government has more interest in that side. They all debate on what they should release to the public since the press has already gotten word of this. Because you remember Frank Joyce is the one who uh told him to or told Mac to call that post and they went and investigated it, you know. So the press already knows about this. So they're like, all right, we're going to have to release something or they're going to be beaten at the door. So it's then that the base commander, okay, so it's important. We'll establish this right now. So Walter Hout is the first lieutenant. He's the public relations officer. Okay, public information officer. He's the PR guy. All right. Now, Major Jesse Marcel is an intelligence officer. Colonel Blanchard is the base commander of Army, of the Roswell Army Airfield. General Roger Ryan is the brigadier general. He's over Colonel Blanchard. And their main headquarters is in Fort Worth, Texas, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. So I just want to kind of give you who everybody is and where these orders are coming from, because this next part is important. So. It, so then it is the base commander, Colonel Blanchard, who calls Walter Howe. Walter Howe sent his day. He gets called. It's Colonel Blanchard. Get a pen and a pad. Dictate what I'm about to tell you. He writes it down. And this here is what the article read. Give me just a second to cough. <laughs> I'm going to... The suspense is killing me. I know. He just keeps giving, telling us more and more things we're going to find out. And I want to know them right now. I don't know. It's just like you'll you'll find out about this later. Easy, easy, Coming up next. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. Coming, uh, coming soon here on AI <laughs> Appalachian Intelligence. We'll tell you about Colonel Blanchard and what he. But not yet. <laughs> Give me a second. I got more things. We'll to tell sell you, you the whole seat, but you'll okay. only need the edge. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm watching American Idol, and Ryan Seacrest is getting ready to tell me exactly who made it to the top five. I was right after the break. No, I keep thinking like he's gonna. Ryan's gonna give me the rose. I'm getting the rose during the ceremony of the bachelor, but I'm still just standing there and there's still commercials going on. And everybody's looking at me and maybe I'm not getting the rose, but there's still a chance I can get the rose. I yeah. Want the rose, Ryan, give me the rose right now. All right. So we've, we've established that Colonel Blanchard is the one who gave the order. He told how dictate what I'm telling you word for word. And release this to the press. Right. This was the press release. This is what the headlines read. So imagine you hear the little beep, 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 beep. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> hold on I got it. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, go ahead. Okay, in my best 1940s uh, news anchor voice. Please. Uh, the many rumors regarding the flying disc became a reality yesterday when the intelligence office of the 509th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force, Roswell Army Airfield, was fortunate enough to gain possession of a disc through the cooperation of one of the local ranchers and sheriff's office of Chaves County. I gotta kiss my breath. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that was awesome. The flying object landed on a ranch sometime last week, not having a phone facilities. The rancher stored the disc until such time as he was able to contact the sheriff's office, who in turn notified Major Jesse A. Marcel of the 509th Bomb Group Intelligence Office. Action was immediately taken, and the disc was picked up at the rancher's home. It was inspected at the Roswell Army Airfield and subsequently loaned by Major Marcel to higher headquarters. Okay. Yes. So that was the press release. So when this headline hits, it causes quite a stir, as you can imagine. Sure, and yeah. Absolutely. House office starts receiving calls from all over the world, requesting interviews, wanting more details, wanting pictures of the stuff. And none of these are answered because it just so happens on that day, a little bit after that press release, you know, the statement was released. Colonel Blanchard comes in and tells how, hey, why don't you take the rest of the day off? Because here's another important thing. How and Blanchard have been in service together and worked together for a very long time, different bases and even during the war. They're really close buddies, you know. Like Blanchard is kind of a role model, kind of a mentor to Hout, and they're really close friends. So this is one of the thing reasons Hout has been so tight-lipped about all this, because he promised his friend as well as his duty to his country, and God bless that man for that. So we've gone over Colonel Blanchard, says, hey, why don't you just head on home for the day? So the debris is actually shipped out the same day the original report came out. And it's escorted by Major Jesse Marcel, the intelligence officer. And it's headed for the 8th Air Force headquarters at Fort Worth. That's presided over by General Roger Ramey. Okay, so after Ramey inspects the debris... The next statement released is much different than the original. But before we get there, let's talk about back at Roswell, Marcel is loading the debris onto a plane while being watched over by Colonel Blanchard and a guy by the name of Lieutenant Shirky. Now, Shirky's heard all the rumors. He just hasn't seen any of it. So imagine he's standing, facing the plane at attention. The Colonel Blanchard, a big imposing dude, is standing right in front of him, and he can't see anything. And he's trying not to, you know, break formation, but he's trying to see. And eventually, you know, he speaks up, and he asks Blanchard, Sir, Colonel, can you turn to the side? Can you turn sideways? Because I want to see too. Now, Blanchard is normally like kind of a stern dude, but he obliges Shirky and he sees what seems to be brushed metal, a few thin beams with odd markings on them. Now, it's also worth noting that the plane that was being loaded is a B 29 bomber named Dave's Dream, which is one of the three planes that flew to Hiroshima, and this plane happened to record the event. So not only did this plane, you know, watch the destruction of an entire island, just about it, but now it carried the Roswell debris from Roswell to Fort Worth. Hmm. That's no coincidence, right? We can all three agree on that. I don't think that's a coincidence. Well, I mean, that is where those bomber planes would have been. Right, but I don't know. That's, that's a little 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, what other technology is on that plane? Right. That's the same plane that is carrying possible extraterrestrial material and 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 wreckage and technology maybe it's also going to be the same plane that drops an a bomb on hiroshima yeah that's yeah i'm not buying little, it yeah uh, okay i'm not continue, buying it just continue sir i'm not buying it because number 1 is the government and number 2 <laughs> number 2 <laughs> Is that's a crazy coincidence. And really, really quickly, I just can I say something really fast, Ryan? I don't want to break the story. And I'm not trying to get sidetracked. No, I man. just wish that I just wish that I would have had a sound bite from the second play that I watched today. It was the ad, it, advanced class play. There was a statement made in that play that I wish I would have had a sound bite of to use on the podcast. And it was as quoted here. These people are wary. Oh, no, no, no. How was it put? Oh, crap. <laughs> no, that, was, that was a whole build up for nothing. Oh, oh, uh, okay. I'm back. You know, we're a wary bunch. No, how crap. Alyssa, <laughs> come tell us your line, please. Oh, no, no, no. I got it. I got it. I got it. You know, these heel folk are a wary bunch. Especially of the government. <laughs> that was a line in the second play that I that I watched today. You know these hill folk are a wary bunch, especially of the government. That's Tis all. true. Tis true. I wish I could have. I wish I could have soundbited that and used it. Anyway, proceed. I'm sorry. I just had to share that. No, no, you're fine. You're fine. So we were just talking about Shirky and Blanchard at, as they're loading that plane. I told you that's the plane that was at Hiroshima. Shirky asked Blanchard to turn to the side, right? Nine days later, uh, after Shirky asked Blanchard to turn sideways so he could see too, he shipped off to Clark Field in the Philippines, who, according to his superiors, urgently needed a weight and balances officer. But when he gets there, the commanding officer of that base is confused because they have no need for a weight and balances officer, and never sent requests for one. Hmm. Later, Shirky would recall that every one of those that were there that day was shipped off so that no two of them would be based together. Hmm. Yeah. That's so, interesting. Uh, yeah, Shirky, nine days later, after he asked to see, was shipped off. Also not a coincidence. No. <laughs> done purposefully i mean when they tell you oh yeah you gotta go here they urgently need this and you get there and they're like what we never, yeah we never asked for that <laughs> who the hell are you <laughs> but all right so planes loaded takes off marcel gets the disc and the debris to general ramey who tells him that he wants him to post some from for some photos which as we talked about earlier will become the most famous Roswell photos out there. And, uh, but after this, things get a little wonky for Marcel. And it gets a little wonky for Marcel. And uh, also, we'll talk a little bit about that guy, Mac Brazel, that sheep rancher, who was convinced that that wasn't no weather balloon material that was on his property. That was something weird. But see, uh, some officials came and picked him up at his ranch, and he was gone for ten days. But when he came back, he told his family he was, he's convinced that's weather balloon. So he got straight MK altered. <laughs> yeah, like they straight up, like men in black, straight up showed him the light. Came and picked up Mister Brazil, Brazil. Basil, whatever his name is. Men in Black straight came and, and J and K came and picked this dude up and just, like brain swapped him. Pretty much. 
All right. Okay. Freaking so that, Tommy Lee Jones. So that right there. Am I muted? Nope. No. Okay. I couldn't see my. So that right there pretty much wraps up just introducing everybody, getting the names out there. Whew. All right. I'm going to kind of go back over and we're coming back modern day where I started the story. All right. And it's, uh, it's, it's December, 2002 again. All right. And then I clicked that way too hard. Son of a. Okay. It's December, 2002 again, winter time, you know? So, uh, we know, First Lieutenant Walter Howitt, he's at home right now, all right? His doorbell rings. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold up. I think I think we might need to wait on Lance. I don't know where he had to go, but I think we may need to wait on him for this. I can edit all this out. This is... Uh, no, I'm don't, talking, e don't edit this out. We'll just talk about it. So... This is pretty much, I'm just bringing you back. This is before he's going to go to the notary. Okay. This is when he's going to actually create his affidavit. Right. Yeah. And his daughter is going to help him. She's actually going to write everything, type everything up. So, and, and Walter Hout in, in 2002, this was the PR guy. That yes. was over Roswell. So this is this is the guy that literally would have been. It's like the press secretary to the president. Yes, I mean, he th released. This is the this is the mouthpiece yes. for everything that went on, everything you know, whatever the narrative was, whatever was was given to the public. This is what the public needs to know. Nothing more. Nothing less. This is the guy. Yeah, he spoke for Colonel Blanchard. Got it. And okay, so proceed. Press conferences, anything like that, you would see Walter Hout, and he would be up on the podium answering all the questions off the little cards that he was given and what he's allowed to say. So at that time, this would have been the face of the Roswell crash. Yes. Because all you military guys, all these people that are really calling the shots, nobody's going to know their name. Yeah, and remember, it was different back then. It's not like they're getting at a podium and all right. these yeah, people yeah, yeah, yeah. are throwing ridiculous questions at them because actual journalism existed back then. So Exactly. exactly. But this guy and all the quotes that would have been in the papers, all the radio broadcasts, it would have been his voice or his name after the quotes. Yes. This is the PR guy. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Guys, just bear with me. I told you I wrote this, and I put my own spin on it, and I meant every word of what I said. So you guys buckle up, okay? I'm buckled, son. All right. It's 2002. Now, Lance, I kind of set the scene for Justin. This is a uh, uh, pre-written affidavit. His daughter is actually going to type it out for him. Right now, he's at his home. It's December 2002. He's 80 years old right now. Okay, he doesn't die until 2005 at 83. But uh, he has his daughter and his um, friend coming. So, so it's December 2002. His doorbell rings right on schedule. Slowly makes his way to the door. He can see the shadowy figure shifting impatiently. But there isn't anything sinister about these shadows. No, sir. It's the hookers he ordered, along with the circus midget, three shaved hamperters, and more lube than it takes to get Lizzo in one of her concert costumes. Of course, that was all nonsense. It was his daughter, Julie, smiling face that greeted him when he opened the door, along with his good friend and ufologist, Don Schmidt. So he grabs up Julie in a warm embrace and a hug there and greets her, greets his old friend. Now... It's worth noting about Don Schmidt that he was an art graduate whose career took an unexpected turn. He was an avid believer in uh, extraterrestrial life forms. Uh, he was a former director at the J. Allen Hynek Center for UFO Studies. 
uh, author of hundreds of articles on UFOs and leader of no fewer than four archaeological digs at the crash site in Roswell, New Mexico. So he's dedicated decades to uncovering the truth of what happened to Roswell. Like Roswell is his his mecca. You know what I mean? That's his that's his Mona Lisa. That's he spent his whole life just obsessed with Roswell. So that's he had actually interviewed Walter Hout. They became friends, you know. Um, so we got let's see, but today isn't a social visit. Today is a culmination of a series of conversations the three have had. This has not been an easy decision for Walter. After a lifetime of silence, he is the last man standing from a very select group who were on the base in 1947. Uh, time has taken many of his brothers in arms away, a few of which tried to have their say on what happened as well, which we're going to talk about. So Walter's very aware that if he doesn't confess to what he knows, it will likely die with him. And he's also kind of aware, you know, he's 80 years old. He, how much time could it, he could go at any moment? So he invites them both to sit down on the couch and he tells Dawn that it is time they had a chat about what happened back then. However, Walter insists that he will not say a word unless both vow that not one word of what he says will be told until he has passed on. Now, Walter wasn't ill, and his death could be for many years, but it was non-negotiable. Like, if they couldn't agree to that, he just, it would die with him. So he's kept quiet all these long years out of, you know, sense of honor and duty to Colonel William Blanchard and also, you know, his country. So... Walter walks through the detail, uh, talks through details of how and when it should be released and so forth. Dawn agrees to everything as well, and he leaves. So I don't know why I wrote that like I did because it, <laughs> the way it actually goes. So he tells Dawn they need to have this chat about this, but what the what it comes down to, what they decide on is. What Walter decides on ultimately is he's only going to share this with Julie right now because she's going to dictate it to his affidavit. Cough break. He's struggling, guys. I hate this. Okay, so. So Don leaves and Walter and Julie... You know, they start going over everything. So they're going to they're going to do their best to make sure everything is clear and unequivocal because, you know, he won't be around to answer questions when this goes out. Um, and once they finish, Julie makes him an appointment, of course, with the notary we were talking about. And uh, for now. It's going to stay between the two of them. So, as I said before, December 15th, 2005, Walter passes away at the age of 85 or 83. So now this allows Julie to share the affidavit with Don Schmidt, but it isn't released immediately. Don uses it as a centerpiece of his best selling book, Witness to Roswell published in 2007. So Don sees this, you know, and it's evidently he either had the idea for the book before or after he reads it, he's like, no, we've got, we've got to do something about this. You know, like this is too good to just release this to the public. So he writes the book and of course, it's a bestseller. Cough break. Really, really struggling, guys. 
you heal folks should y'all are absolutely yeah. for him to be soldiering through this and be as sick as what he is right now. He's a trooper. He's a trooper. Y'all have a, a, a colonel in your midst right now. <laughs> I don't know about all that. All right. So he writes his best selling book uh, titled Witness to Roswell. It's published in 2007. And what it contains is a long, it's a far cry from the explanation given by the army. And different it was indeed. Uh, the first three pages contain strange drawings of little creatures with what appeared to have huge dicks. <laughs> Listen, you can't make this up. The next three pages contain the same creatures, but instead of huge dick, ample breast and the thickest of peaches. His words. But it was at this point, Don realized the pages, these pages in particular, were kind of sticky and clinging to his fingers, so he quickly scanned <laughs> forward. And that's the part when I was so high the other day and I was writing this, I laughed until I almost passed out because I started coughing so hard. And then I forgot where I was going with the joke and had to remember it again. <laughs> Okay, and of course, all of that was false. Sorry <laughs> about that. Ah, <laughs> uh, here we are. Uh, what the book actually contained was explosive enough to reignite the debate and ask the eternal question once again. What really crashed in the New Mexico desert all those years ago? So now we're going to get... <laughs> are you Okay. Not really, dude. Well, you guys <laughs> laugh it for a second because I've got to. I've got to take a cough break. Please, this is so good. I had to go get something to eat. Just like listen to it. Oh my gosh! Could you imagine if that's lit? If <laughs> listen, I knew like when you first said it, I was like, wait, maybe. <laughs> and I realized. No. <laughs> this guy. Could you this imagine? Guy. Could you imagine? No. All right. All right. Honestly. Honestly. <clears throat> in all seriousness. Could you imagine the PR guy for all of the Roswell stuff when it all went down in 47? He <laughs> sits you down. He's like, look, I'm telling you everything I know. I'm telling you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. You, you have to swear an oath, a vow that you're not going to speak of this until I'm gone. And then he starts drawing all these little pictures. Of this. this is what I seen, and it was just gigantic genitalia. He's like, I, see, I, I can't even do it justice. Like, I'm trying to draw it to scale, but I can't even do the justice. The and that's all he gave. You don't understand. <laughs> and then I looked there for a second, and then behind the well endowed small creature was. Some cakes on a creature that I just <laughs> can't even I don't even know how to even begin to uh, caked up. Long. They were caked up, son. They were only three foot tall, but they were caked up. There's a theory going that the reason Brigadier General Ramey hated these huge cocked aliens so much was because he in fact did suffer from micro penis. And that's why he <laughs> changed the story. It's like a button on a fur coat. Man. Listen, guys, it's real. Play some Sarah McLaughlin while I say this. All right. We are so <laughs> All right. <laughs> Wait, I got to mute. I, got, I can't make myself laugh. I'll start coughing. That's why I'm trying not to laugh at any of these. Which really ruins the joke, by the way, when you don't laugh at it to get other people to laugh at it. So you guys are doing great. Well, it's enough laughter here. Enough laughter. All right. Let's, get to, the, let's get to the meat of the story here. 
So just a quick overview view. Roswell incident, summer is July 1947. Actually, actually, the crash was, you know, the debris was in the field for quite some time before. So the crash actually happened long before, you know, they actually thought it had been there yeah. for a minute. So, yeah. Cause you know, oh, Mac, he didn't even know what this shit was out in his fields, you know, cleaning it up until he goes to town. He's like, hmm, might be them there flying discs. Yeah. So, all right. So, all this has happened. Army Center Intelligence Officer Major Jesse Marcel to investigate. Bloody blah, blah. All right. Now, it's when, uh, Let's see, he, uh, Walter issues a statement of the captured flight and saucer, but soon after, the Army changed their statement to the materials being that of a weather balloon. And it just kind of fizzled out of the news. It may have faded from the public, but it certainly lived on in the minds of those who were there. So the story likely would have stayed faded out had it not been for the interest of one man. And that man's name is Stanton Friedman. He was a nuclear physicist by trade, but left that field in the 19, in 1970 to focus full time on his passion. And just so you guys know, I tried really hard to put a joke in right there. <laughs> I was waiting on it. I tried so hard. Cause I, at first, I was going to say the capturing and reproducing of the naked star-nosed mole rat. <laughs> but then I was like, I have no information to go any further, and I don't know anything about mole rats to make it funny. And I was like, maybe I'll just ad-lib like I'm doing right now and yeah. talk about what I was possibly going to joke about. Yeah. So that's what I went with. And it's still funny. <laughs> but his passion was the research and investigation of flying saucers. He gave lectures at over 600 colleges through 50 states and published more than 80 papers on the subject. Mm -hmm. He was even asked to provide testimony over congressional hearings and was invited to speak at the United Nations. When Stanton spoke, people listened. In February 1978, Stanton found himself in a unique spot. He was able to get an interview with Major Jesse Marcel, the officer who recovered the material from the crash site. Now, Marcel isn't just a normal witness. He's a war hero. He's a former intelligence officer and a man who spent most of his life in a select circle of trust dealing with matters of national security. So Jesse Marcel is like a top notch dude. Like he, he's an intelligence officer. He is handled that's top secret security clearance. Like you can't get any higher than that. He's trusted. Okay. So his, his reputation is just stellar. All right. So when Freeman asked Marcel, what happened back then? He knows that he can get the weather balloon story. But he's determined to probe the former officer and put him under the spotlight if he does. But Marcel's answers take Freeman by surprise. Now, what kind of probing are we talking about? Like probing uh, with questions? Only, only anal. Only anal. <laughs> okay, um, great. This okay. is government torture, Justin. Think about it. What are you gonna, How are you going to torture somebody with questions? Okay, yeah, that's true. It's true. It's I'm only anal probing. I just Plus, we're to make, dealing with Roswell, so we know it's anal probing. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that's what we were talking about. Okay, I just got to take a drink, guys. I don't have to cough, so I'm not going to mute yeah. myself. It's okay. You do what you got to do, buddy. You 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 push through. You keep uh, I'm pushing. pushing through. I'm pushing through. And I told you I wasn't high. Yeah, you're doing good. <laughs> you're doing good. Where I'm where sick. are we? Where are we at in this story? Where are we at? Like. We're an hour in. Where are we at? Oh, are you thinking? Uh, let me look. Let's see. 
I'm starting on page three, and there's uh, 10 pages. 10 pages? I, I told you, I spent hours writing this. Holy crap. We may have to do, this may have to be a two-parter. I will have to find a good cutoff spot. Yeah, find a good cutoff spot. Like leave leave them hanging, dude. Leave them hanging. Uh, let me keep looking. Let me keep looking. Oh, let's see. Because uh... we're we're already an hour in, and I feel like this story is just getting started. Okay, I see. Let's see. Yeah, I see a wrap up spot. Okay. How about I just finish uh, about Major Marcel here? Yeah, sure. I'll just finish up his story here. Okay. Okay, so here we go. So Marcel's answers take Freeman by surprise, of course. Uh, instead of stonewalling every question, he opens and tells Freeman that the material he recovered from the crash site was not of this earth. Hmm. Now, later he would do, he went on to do more interviews via radio and even television and seemed to open up more and more each time. Now he goes back to where it all began, to where he, Mac Brazel, and another guy, now see that Marcel had to return back a second time to the site and he took captain Sheridan Cavett with him and they collected boxes and boxes of this debris, you know, that became the center of this whole conspiracy. So it's late summer in 1980 and somewhere out in the most desolate parts of New Mexico, a caravan of three cars with Jesse Marcel riding shotgun approached the spot of the crash site. Marcel has agreed to go to the site with the popular TV show In Search Of. So upon reaching the site, Marcel strolls around, stopping in certain spots as if he were reliving the experience from 33 years ago. Like They said he was just kind of like wandering around, you know, and then he would stop in certain spots like he was just remembering, you know, and then. Of course, the camera crew, they're all get they're setting everything up, microphone booms and all that. And they call Marcel over. And in his deep Louisiana Bayou accent, he starts talking. They took pictures, of course. He said of the day in General Ramey's office when the press was there. They wanted some comments from me, but I wasn't at liberty to do that. He stares, down, he stares down the camera as he talks. No sign of nerves. He's freaking, it's like perfect recall. And uh, he said, so all I could do was keep my mouth shut. It was General Ramey who told the newsman that it was, it was a weather balloon and to forget about it. <laughs> it was nothing more than a weather balloon is what, General Ramey said. Of course, we both knew differently. I had never seen anything like that before. It was not anything from this earth. Before his death in 1986, he spoke with Don Schmidt and Thomas Carey, the authors of the bestseller Witness to Roswell. So he did, he gave them an interview as well. So Marcel walks them through the events. From going out to the site to transporting the debris to Fort Worth. And he kind of fills in his gaps surrounding the secrecy around the base. Uh, for example, there was a press conference that followed that photo shoot he was in. And even though he was the man who spent more time with that material than anybody else, he was not invited to that press conference. And that's when the statement was changed to it's a weather balloon. Hmm. So uh, not only that, they put him in a room and kind of 
lock the door for 24 hours. He doesn't even know the statement's been changed to weather balloon. He has no idea what takes place the entire time. They kept him under lock and key for 24 hours in seclusion at Fort Worth. This is when he got the material to Fort Worth. That's where those pictures were taken in uh, General Roger Ramey's office. That is nuts, dude. Like, that's so insane that you take a, an integral part of the recovery process of this crash and you say, hey, let's transport this stuff to this base in Fort Worth and then upon arrival, we're just going to lock you in a room for 24 hours. First man to take hit. pictures with it. You trust the guy enough to bring it out there, be involved in the picture-taking process, to be, you know, you trust him enough to obviously deal with some pretty highly classified stuff and then when it gets to the point to the, the point to put it out to the press you don't trust him anymore yeah he's not yeah. invited so uh he's kept in seclusion for the next 24 hours while the news story makes the front pages only after this time out was he allowed to go back to Roswell and upon arrival went to see his friend and associate, Captain Cabot, the guy that was out there helping him collect it. Uh, Marcel recounts the conversation. I would like to see the reports of what happened here while I was in Fort Worth, to which Captain Cabot replies, what reports? I don't know what you're talking about. So Marcel kind of Getting a little angry, how it rank you. Cabot states, look, I take my orders from Washington, so if you have a problem, take it up with them. So in one of his final interviews, Marcel is quoted as saying, I haven't told everything. There's a hell of a lot I haven't said. I'm a trained intelligence officer, and once you do that, it's with you for life. So to wrap up Jesse Marcel's involvement, consider this. The story of it being a weather balloon means that Jesse Marcel made a mistake and that he did not recognize the debris he spent all day collecting for what it was, an ordinary balloon. For that to add up, he made a major error in judgment with the material that he had extensive training with which is highly unlikely. Jesse Marcel passed away of emphysema in 1986 and took further secrets he may have kept with him. While he was the first to speak out, he wouldn't be the last. It's almost as if Marcel made it easier for others to speak up that were harboring the same secrets. And that's where I'm going to leave you right now, guys, because we have a lot more accounts to go into. Uh, we have Walter's affidavit to get to. Man. And uh, it's pretty freaking cool. This is awesome. That was awesome, Ryan. Well done. I still, still got more to go, guys. This is a two-parter, maybe a three-parter. I mean, depending yeah. on where the conversation goes, this is this is great. I, when I heard the story, I was like, we have to do this, and I'm going to make it. I did it different than what they did on that podcast. You can't change the dates, the statements, and the facts of the story, of course. Right, yeah, of course. But they did it a lot more eloquently than I just did. I can promise you that. <laughs> well, look, we uh, – Your folk know eloquent is not our niche. We I was, don't do. I, I, I'm lucky. I just pronounced that word correctly. That was. <laughs> we don't do eloquence. We do. We just do. Con we just do conversation, man. We just like yeah. to converse. But and that's what I'm saying. Like this is totally out of the realm of what we usually do with this deep dive and all this info. But man, I am loving it. Like, you know, I'm locked ob in. Yeah, obviously. We all know about Roswell. We all know the the highlights. We all know, you know, most of, of us in the weird realm 
Like we know what the government said. We know what Washington and the, and the press and all the, all those people that were involved then, you know what they said. Yeah. But you also know what people have said and spoken about, you know, for years and years and years and years now about how, no, it wasn't no weather balloon. Mm. It was this kind of material, you know, there were uh, extraterrestrial bodies recovered. You know, there were autopsies going on at Area 51. There were like, it's, mm -hmm. it's set up this, but it's one of those things like it's created so much lore around it in the UFO community that you don't know what to grasp onto. You don't know what to believe. You, you, you don't know what's fact and what's fiction. So, yeah. I mean, the stuff that you're diving into and digging into right now, like you can't argue this stuff as fact. And, and just the things that you've said would make anybody with half a brain stop and say, wait a minute. So you're telling me that everybody that was there involved in the, the recovery process of this debris, they all got split up. They all got sent to different locations to work. They got sent to places that didn't even know they were coming or needed them to begin with. And then you have the people involved in their elder years saying, I'm not taking it to my grave. I, I got to say something. Yeah. But even that, but even that has been suppressed. Like this affidavit that you're getting ready to talk about, I don't know anything about. Yeah. I'd never know anything about it. So, I mean, that's, gosh, I don't know. I'm excited. So that man. does make it more interesting that it, you know, how is this not more well known? Like, how yeah. is this not out there? You know, why are we not hearing about this? But I'm sure well, those think, in the in the conspiracy theory fields out there, they've known about it. Like if they hear this, they're not like, surprised. You guys never heard of this. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm sure you know. Uh, obviously, we don't know. Well, I was going to say we don't know everything. We don't really know anything. <laughs> we just talk about cool crap. But yeah. like the stuff that blows me away, it, it, it's always. It's always like those initial report kind of things that that really get my gears turning. Like, you know, you read that initial news report that was put out there about these flying discs and all this different stuff. And then, boop, done. That's erased. And back in 47, you could do that. You know, it wasn't like today where you have oh, yeah. social media, where you have the internet, where if, if if you make a comment about anything, I don't care how quickly you delete it. Somebody's got a screenshot. Well, think Somebody's about, got to think about the time too. I mean, this is, you know, World War One, World War Two is a time when the entire nation came together mm -hmm. during a war. So military members were looked at very differently back then that was when the military said it's a weather balloon forget about it the press freaking forgot about it yeah and so did everybody else and you're talking about a time when pots and pans and everything were donated across the country to melt down and make bullets like yeah. you know this is a time when the country really came together as we should you know but so what I'm trying to say is when the military tells them something, that's what's, you know, that's what's going to happen. And that's what happened. Yeah. Had it not been for just the cop one, that one dude, Stanton Friedman, you know? Yeah, this is great. This is awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm loving this. It's kind of like, uh, I learned today. Here's a little tidbit I might get into later. Maybe for the Patreon. Ooh. But did you know the Cold War was started by one man? And it's not even anybody you would think. Hmm. It was a British man. Hmm. Yeah. David Beckham. Close. He was just as handsome, but not Ooh. as talented in the sports area. He was a physicist, actually. Hmm. Yeah. 
You're so you're being so sneaky, Ryan. Damn. You're so mysterious right now. This new yeah. mysterious coy Ryan, little thing, you coy little boy, you. <laughs> I'm liking it though. I'm I like it. I like mysterious Ryan. Yeah. Just throw some jokes in there. You know what? Since this is gonna be a two parter, I might go back and try to throw more jokes in. Yeah. You got more time to think so. about it. We'll make this a however many parter we have to make it. It's interesting. I love it. Uh, yes. This is great. Yeah, man. So if you want to do this part one, we'll do part two next time. Well, it probably right. more, yeah. more conversation because, you know, I only got like six more pages to read. Only six more pages. <laughs> no big deal. Yeah, man. Dude, that's crazy. You put this much effort into an episode. I'm so proud of you. Okay. I haven't put I haven't put this Baby much effort in this. Baby up on us. <laughs> I was going to say I haven't put that much effort in this whole podcast, but I, that's that's a lie. That's a I, lie. I, 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 can't, I can't say that. I haven't put this much effort. You haven't, Lance. You're going to have to step it up at some point. Or we're probably going to have to let you go. All right. <laughs> Don't threaten me with a good time. I'll never let you go. <laughs> I'll never let you go. <laughs> I'll never let anything happen to you, Sugar Bear. <laughs> <laughs> all right boys well i think this is a fun one this is super interesting stuff this isn't our usual bag uh you know usually it's a whole lot more conversation and just free flowing and, and theorizing and all this but i'm liking it i'm liking this so hill folk we hope you enjoyed it as well if you did let us know if you like these deep dives you know, let us know what you like. Let us know because we're 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 malleable. We'll bend. Wait a minute. Malleable means bendy, right? Yep. Okay. I was making sure I was using that in the right context here. I thought it meant apple. I thought it meant like uh, metal. You could it was easy to form, right? Malleable means, malleable means you can put it in thin sheets and move it how you want to. Yeah. More See, Ryan. You can put us into thin sheets and move us however you want. <laughs> you put to. us into thin sheets, yeah. You can move us however you want to, but we ain't gonna move our own asses. You just killed us. Huh? We're malleable. Now we're, now we're thin sheets. And we're thin sheets. Anyway, y'all just let us know. Let us know what you like. If you enjoy this, <laughs> be sure to let us know. Uh, and something I want to mention before we jump out of here. When you get the audio, like when you when you download this on just like an audio platform, you know, sometimes, and it's just sometimes, I don't do it with every episode, you know, sometimes I go in there, I do some editing, you know, I, I work with compression levels and volume levels and some of that different stuff, um, you know, go in and cut out some, it, it just depends on how the episode goes. But usually with audio format, strictly audio, you know, there's some editing done. The YouTube side of it, if you guys go to subscribe to YouTube, not only can you look at these handsome mugs and watch our facial expressions the whole time this is going on, but you get a completely unfiltered, unedited yeah. version of the show. Like, I don't edit shit. I just post it. <laughs> yeah. So, First of all, I, mean, I don't know how. <laughs> second of all, <laughs> even if I did know how, I ain't gonna do it. <laughs> second of all, even if I did know how, I probably wouldn't because I think the raw version is the best version. Yeah, and I know it's a little different. Like you know, if when I'm listening to audio, I want it to be kind of free flowing and not have a bunch of breaks and interruptions and all this different stuff. Cause that aggravates me. I'm not like, I lost track. My ADD starts banging. I just lost track of what was being talked about. Now I got to go back and re-listen and, and try to catch back up. And so with the audio format of it, you know, and usually our conversations, our episodes are pretty free flowing. There's not a whole lot of editing that needs to be done, but I'm just saying, if you want to see the raw, uncut, unfiltered, unedited, just this is us, this is we hit record to start it, and no matter how long we go, we hit record to stop it, that's what you're getting on YouTube. So just want to let you guys know that, let you heal folk know, jump on over to YouTube every now and then, check us out over there too. Um, 
Well, we'll get into that at a different time. Hopefully we're I'm be not doing... as sick next time, Hill Folk, and I can do better without all the cough breaks. Yeah. We're going to be doing some different things in 2023. We're opening up a whole lot of of different stuff. Um, you know, the show's really growing, so we're going to grow with it. We're going to be providing different things. Um, so y'all stick around for that. Just remember, be sure to uh, rate and review Wherever you listen to podcasts, like I was just talking about, mentioning there, be sure to go over to our YouTube channel, Appalachian Intelligence. Subscribe there. Um, as all Riley's po- or uh, YouTubers that she listens to, smash that like button <laughs> yeah. and hit that bell so you can get notified when a new video. Ah, God. Gosh, they kill me. Some of the people that she watches, their voices literally make me want to stab my own eyeballs out. Well, then you'd still hear him, you dumbass. <laughs> no, I wouldn't, because I'd be dead. I'm talking. You'd be blind, and you could still hear the voices. No, I'm talking. I'm talking deep enough in deep enough <laughs> that's just ending everything. I might be a vegetable, oh. but I ain't gonna hear it. <laughs> Ryan, what are you talking about? You got sawdust in your eyes the other day, and you told me you couldn't hear me because you had I sawdust know. in your eyes. I thought that's how it worked. That's how it works. Oh, Hold gosh. on, I can't hear you. My eyes are full of sawdust, <laughs> but. Uh, Again, rate and review wherever you listen to podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Be sure to send us your stories at Appalachian Intelligence at, at gmail.com. Um, you know, again, we schedule interviews on the show. If you have a cool story, if you want to come on, if you had some weird experiences, the weirder the better. We love it. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get you on the show. You know, we're pretty, I mean, we're pretty booked up. It may be a while to get you in, but we'll get you in. If you put in a request, come on the show, we'll get you in at some yeah. point. Absolutely. It may be, it may be a week from now. It may be three months from now. I don't know. Just depend on what the schedule and how it all goes, but we'll get you on the show. So be sure to share or be sure to send us your stories. Most importantly, more importantly than anything else, share the show. Yeah. Share the show however you want to share it. And remember, That's- kids, nobody ever got pregnant from a blowjob. <laughs> uh, and that's it. That's it. <laughs> See you guys later. Love you and mean it. <laughs> we love you. We love you, Hill Folk. I love you, boys. Love you. And until... And until next time, we'll see y'all later.